Thank you very much, Secretary Campbell. It's really fantastic to hear your perspective. And you've really highlighted one of the incredible aspects about the new Colombo plan, which is the diversity. Look around the room. We've got scholars and alumni here from across Australia, from a diverse range of backgrounds. Um, so it's wonderful to have you all together. So now we're gonna move into our first panel session. That's what these chairs are here for. I know you've been wondering. And the first panel is entitled The View to 2030, because we want you to have a bit of a forward gaze now. Where are we headed over the next eight years? We're really lucky to have an informed and wide range of expertise on our panel this morning. And I would first like to welcome the panel facilitator, who is Susanna Patton. Susanna is a research fellow at the, and project director in the Power and Diplomacy program at the Lowy Institute. And Susanna will introduce the rest of the panel members who I'll invite onto the stage now too. So without further ado, over to Susanna. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shona, and it's a real privilege for me to be here this morning and to be chairing this wonderful <coughs> panel on such an important topic of the view out to 2030. So let me briefly introduce the panel and set the scene for the conversation that we'll have over the next 45 minutes or so. So first we have Christine Clark, Australia's Ambassador for Women and Girls. We're joined by Doug Ferguson, the New South Wales Chairman and Head of Asia and International Markets at KPMG. John Wellard, the Policy Director International at Universities Australia. And Ellie Williams, Director of Australia Indonesia Consulting and a PhD candidate here at ANU. So the theme for this discussion is the view out to 2030, and we'll be discussing the changes that we'll see in Australia and our region over the next eight or so years, what they mean for Australia's connections to the region, um, the opportunities, um, including through programs like the New Colombo Plan, and the impact that these changes will have on the opportunities um, that you'll all face during your careers. So, to kick off our discussion, I'm going to ask each of our speakers to give their view on what the region looks like in 2030. How does it look compared to where we are today? What are the key trends shaping the region? And what's that going to mean for young Australians such as yourselves who are looking to kickstart their careers in the Indo-Pacific and participate in the new Colombo plan? So I'll turn over to our speakers in the order that they're sitting and I'll start with you, Christine. Can you give us your view on the view out to 2030? Thanks, Susanna. Um, it probably is no surprise to um, these very intelligent people in this room that COVID-19 is really challenging the region and it will continue to challenge the region for a, a protracted period of time. Um, we're, we're dealing with, you know, the intersectionality of climate change, conflict, instability, um, and, and against that we're trying to advance gender equality. Um, gender inequality is a real challenge and you know the assessment has been made you know we were we were tracking we were moving to toward the goal of gender equality and we were already facing the likelihood that that would take us around a hundred years COVID-19 has pushed that back a further 36 years um, so we're starting behind where we started. But the things that we really need to address um, and what we've observed is that women are shouldering the burden, the economic burden of COVID-19 because of the um, industries that they're primarily employed in, in the hospitality um, um, and, and though, you know, primarily hospitality, tourist, tourist industries in the, in the Pacific. Um, one of the statistics that really concerns me greatly is the increase in gender-based violence that has occurred as a result of COVID-19. It has seriously um, increased 
um, and I can get to some statistics later, but I think you know, we sort of need to move across. The increase in unpaid domestic labour for women as they meet the caring responsibilities um, and those other responsibilities that come with COVID-19. The impact on girls' education. Many girls will not return to school once schools reopen. Um, that is a real challenge for us. We need them to return to school. We need those opportunities to increase. The unavailability of sexual and reproductive health care for women and girls is a real issue. And so we need you know, all of those things to be a part of our focus as we move forward and ensuring that development in the Indo-Pacific um, and global recovery actually gives a voice to women and girls, that they are included in the conversations they're not just in the room serving tea and coffee, they're actually at the table making decisions and having their voices heard. We act, you know, and we need you to be part of that conversation of how we empower those young women to get in the room and the older women to get in the room and have their voices heard. Um, these new connections that the secretary was talking about will help us to grow um, understanding in the region of what is possible. By your actual presence, you will be able to have those conversations with people about growing those um, opportunities for women and trying to counter the lost development that's occurred. Um, one of the other challenges for us in the region um, is the geostrategic competition. That will make um, connections that you make a little more difficult, um, a little more challenging, but you need to be aware of those and, and work through those and there is education available to you on how to do that. Um, but what I would like to say is you have a wonderful opportunity to be part of what 2030 actually looks like in the region. You can bring your influence to bear to empower women and girls in our region. That's great. And I think we can come back to that topic of how the New Colombo plan can be part of that change in terms of women's empowerment later in our discussion. But I'll throw it to Doug now for your, for your thoughts on this question. Thanks, Susanna, and thanks, Christine. Um, can I add my congratulations to you all um, for, uh, for receiving scholarships? Can I thank the alumni and members of the Diplomatic Corps and the NCP Secretariat that have done an outstanding job in bringing this um, together today. Um, 2030, gosh, if I do the maths, I'll be 55. That's a bit scary. And uh, don't, don't worry, you'll be 28 or 29. You'll be in the <laughs> midst of your career. You'll be taking on leadership roles, hopefully progressing Australia's uh, role and, and engagement with the region. So this is the start of a, a really important journey for each of you and I would grab it with both hands, and especially the next uh, couple of days, um, those that were here yesterday and those that are going to be here tomorrow. So we only have to look to understand what's going to be looking like in five to eight years. Think about what's happened in the last five years in our region. So much has fundamentally shifted. Um, China, under President Xi, has, uh, has changed direction, has become far more assertive uh, in its foreign policy settings. Uh, the US under firstly President Trump slightly withdrew from the region and under President Biden are re-engaging. We've seen Australia as a middle power play a really important role in adapting to our reality of being uh, a major trade partner with China and a major military alliance partner with the US. And we've played an instrumental role in, in bringing uh, the Quad together, AUKUS. Uh, we're supporting the rules-based order you know, the WTO, the World Bank, all of the, the things that have been incredibly important for stability of our region um, and protecting human rights and the climate. So a lot has changed. Australia's played a leading role. If we look forward uh, for the next five to eight years, I'm afraid um, it's going to be uh, continually uh, bumpy. And I've come up with six Ds. Doug's six Ds. <laughs> Bear with me. The first D is... Disruption. Uh, constant geostrategic competition is going to lead to geopolitical contest in the region. We're not through with COVID. It isn't done with us yet. And many countries in our region 
are in various stages of COVID battles uh, and it will impact us now and into the future. And perhaps the biggest battle is the one for climate and also social equity. Massive disruption, first D. Second D, uh, decoupling. We've seen uh, Australia, as I've mentioned, uh, lead um, the formation of AUKUS, uh, the Quad. Uh, we're a member of Five Eyes. We support the WTO, the United Nations and the World Bank. Some of our major regional partners have joined a different team, uh, which has been called the Arc of Autocracy. Uh, so we can expect some decoupling to continue in the, in the areas of the internet, in, in, in areas of financial services like currencies, um, laws and also freedom of media and the way that we treat media. The third D is the constant digital transformation. And that can be applied very generally, but if you think about trade, we're going to move to uh, a, digital, um, a digital trade uh, currency around blockchain that's going to remove a lot of the, the language and cultural barriers that have been a real hindrance to trade in our region, uh, and it's going to help us uh, expedite uh, trade and quality standards, uh, but, but digital transformation is a big one. The fourth D is diversification. Frankly, Australia has had an incredible run uh, with China, but when it gets up to 40 or 50 per cent of our total exports going to one market, uh, we, needed to, we needed to change anyway. We've got great relationships in many other countries. We've got FTAs in place uh, with Indonesia, <coughs> with India now, with the UK. We're working on one with the EU. So diversification is something that you're all going to have to play a role in as emerging business leaders so that we have balance and we can also have more reliability on our inbound supply chain and investment um, corridors. The fifth D is defence, the merger of defence with business around things like AI, quantum science, biotechnology and space. So defence and business are going to align, the private sector is going to have to support defence and national security. And the final D is decarbonisation, and I think we all know what I'm talking about there. So six Ds, disruption, decoupling, digital transformation, diversification, defence and decarbonisation. Have you all got it? <laughs> Thank you. That's great, and that gives us, um, a, it's a great sort of um, horizon scan that I think we can, we can come back to in the conversation. So, John, can I get your views? How do you see these, these changes and how are they affecting universities in particular? Sure. I was late, so I got the bad microphone, um, <laughs> which I apologise for in advance. Um, so, look, I will concentrate my comments on, on universities. Um, I think Doug's pretty much done a very good coverage of some of the points I would have raised, but I think in terms of um, the university perspectives going out to 2030, uh, it's issues around diversification, as, as has been mentioned, uh, both in terms of where students may come from in terms of um, international student markets, where we send students to in terms of outward bound mobility, but also who we do research with. And that research dimension is, is going to be a, a fraught one for universities moving forward. And uh, uh, cohorts such as yourself play an important role in that because you actually act as sort of the, the vanguard, so to speak in, speak, in terms of a lot of our soft diplomacy efforts. But um, there's, a, there's an imperative for Australia to in, be engaged internationally, both in the region as well as in other regions, in terms of our research capability, just by virtue of the fact that whilst we're a very productive uh, research nation and we have a, have a fantastic research enterprise, we're reliant upon international collaboration. And to do that, we need to maintain relationships with countries that are important to us from a research perspective. And those are countries that are currently in favour, for want of a better word, from a geopolitical perspective, and some of those countries that perhaps form part of the axes that Doug mentioned. Um, and the question is how we go about doing that, how do we ma maintain those sorts of links? And so there's a bit of a tension at the moment in terms of the way the government would like us to do research and the way that research actually happens, and we as universities have to, have to find the balance. But a high degree of uncertainty. Um, a lot of the initiatives and uh, 
thinking that was probably in place back in 27, 2018 has been put by the wayside. And so we're gonna have to reinvent ourselves in many respects in terms of what happens uh, by the time we get to, we get to uh, 2030. But as I said, I think the importance of these sorts of programs, the NCP, can't be understated in these sorts of situations. Despite the geopolitical tensions, uh, despite the rhetoric that comes from various governments in relation to government-to-government uh, -government relationships, the education relationship between Australia and other countries remains strong and will continue to remain strong. And that's where you guys and the program and the program that you're in becomes so important. And it sounds like I'm kind of over-egging it a little bit, but it is of primary importance for Australia that programs such as the New Colombo Plan continue and develop and uh, provide that, that, that service to Australia. But there's also thinking within the sector about what the NCP might look like in 10 years' time as well. And you know, we've touched a little bit about First Nation populations and whether we need to be looking at ways in which we can engage uh, our Indigenous communities in more meaningful and deeper ways through um, the new Colombo Plan. So that's perhaps looking at other target countries, uh, looking at programs that sp specifically support Indigenous uh, outward bound mobility students. So they can have the experiences that are important to them and important to the Indigenous communities, but also important to the First Nation communities that they want to engage with in, in other countries. But a high degree of uncertainty. Um, universities are coming out of what has been a fairly <coughs> tough period for them over the last couple of years. Uh, to be honest with you, I think we're looking to sort of try and, I don't wanna say balance the books, but right the ship, use whatever metaphor you like, uh, between now and the end of the year. Uh, because at the end of the day, our job is as educators, our job is as researchers, uh, our job is to make sure that we provide you guys with the, the, the facilities and the experiences that you need uh, in terms of your education journey. And so the priority is on that at this point in time. We do have one, in eye, one eye in the future, of course, and we're very interested in things that are happening in terms of AUKUS and um, the Quad. Of, obviously, we're not diplomats. We leave that, to the, leave that to the professionals. But I think it is quite telling that both in terms of the Quad, uh, both in terms of the Australia-India relationship, that one of the things that the government has really pushed, one of the things that we really support, is that idea of student mobility. And so we have the Quad Fellowships, which we are keen supporters of. We have the Materi Fellowships from India, which we see Indian students coming to Australia. And we think this is the, the, the future. We've had a pivot away from, from some other countries. The focus is going to be on these uh, these other fellowships, these new range of fellowships, how we're going to support them. And so I think it's sort of a, it's going to be a constant case of perhaps decoupling, to use one of Doug's Ds, and recoupling. So we'll be doing our own pivoting uh, and supporting those sorts of, um, those sorts of programs moving forward. I guess the other thing too is just Australia's role in terms of providing uh, opportunities for people in the region through more unconventional means. And so I'm thinking of things such as short courses, micro-credentials, you know, we, we talk a lot about the need for upskilling in the area of med tech, fintech, you know, choose whatever tech uh, you like. Uh, Australia has worked very hard over the last couple of years to look at ways in which we can provide short courses. There's been regulatory changes made by government that's allowed us to deliver them offshore online. And I think that is going to be one of the major ways that Australia contributes to uh, the well-being of, of the region over, over the next few years. And last, we'll hear from Ellie. You've had a long experience of working with Australia's student mobility programs, especially in Indonesia and elsewhere. How do you see things evolving over the next eight years out to 2030? Thanks, Susanna. I look, first and foremost, I'd like to also thank Auntie Violet for that wonderful welcome to country and extend my uh, re thank yous and respect to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people whose land we meet on today. Uh, and I'd like to extend that respect to other First Nations people with us today as well. Um, like Doug, I'd also like to say a huge congratulations to all of you in the room. It is wonderful to see so many NCP scholars and alumni, business champions, university partners, everybody in the room gathered together again face to face. It's so nice not to be looking at Zoom tiles. <laughs> so welcome to you all. Welcome to the ANU. about this big if we're... <laughs> They'd all be about this big if they're we were looking at thumbnails. Like tiny screens. <laughs> um, look, thanks, Susanna, for the question. Um, 
as we've been hearing a lot about this morning, you know, Secretary Campbell spoke about it, Christine's just spoken about it as well. There are many challenges in our region, you know, climate change, gender equality, social inclusion, uh, you know, recovery from COVID, both economically and strengthening health systems, ensuring uh, the stability of democracies in our region. These are all incredibly important challenges that we face together. But I think more important than that, underpinning our response to these challenges as regional partners is actually focusing on the quality and the health of our bilateral relationships in the region. We can't do this work together if we don't actually have functioning and respectful bilateral relationships. So to take an example with Indonesia, just last week, uh, Lowy released their poll looking at what Indonesia thinks of the world. And in that, I think there's some pretty um, alarming statistics that we see 55% of Indonesians don't have trust in Australia to do the right thing in the region, in the world. This is actually more alarming when you think that this is a 20% drop since the 2011 uh, polling data that Lowy did. And of course, Susanna, correct me on these numbers um, at, if they're incorrect at all, but a 20% drop since 2011 when that poll was last conducted. So what does this actually say about the quality of that relationship and the way that our neighbours perceive us? I think this is really important to think through in terms of our relationships in the region and if we're getting them right. We need to get these relationships right. We need to get public diplomacy right in our region. Um, the New Colombo Plan, of course, is an incredible part of all of that. And as we've been hearing this morning already, you all have a role to play in that. If we focus it back to looking towards 2030 and the role that you can all play in this, we know that there's 60% of the world's young people that live in the Indo-Pacific region. So in the next eight years, moving towards tackling these issues, you'll all be playing an important role in that work in building the connections as you go out into the region. And for those alumni that are in the community here today, as you're reflecting how you do that work when you come back to Australia, how you maintain those connections with the people that you met in the region. This is really important work. Um, and I think we only need to look at the sort of enduring connections that we've seen with previous scholarship programs like the old Colombo Plan, or now the Australia Awards, to look at the way that those uh, connections and those relationships can be built between individuals and then can actually impact the government to government level as well. So it's, it's really important and I think all of you can play a role in that moving towards 2030 as young people in the region. Mm. Thank you. Maybe we can just stay with you now, Ellie, for, for my next question, which is uh, how do you think the new Colombo plan has already changed Australia's relationships with countries in the region and how will it continue to do that over the next period of time? Yeah, thank you, Susanna. Look, as I mentioned, I think, you know, we know over many years we've seen the effects and we've seen the results of international education as a form of public diplomacy. When you look at it along with, you know, a suite of activities that the Australian government runs, tourism, cultural diplomacy, sports diplomacy and the like, education, uh, international education in particular, as a form of public diplomacy works. It builds these relationships, it encourages you out into the region to make these connections with people your own age and then form those friendships and maintain those friendships for many years. I mentioned just before the old Colombo Plan, now the Australia Awards. We've seen these connections endure over many years through those scholars. But for the NCP, if we look at the last eight years alone, uh, you know, we now have a community of more than 70,000 young people in Australia who've gone out to the Indo-Pacific region. Between 2014 to 2019, we saw an 83% increase in the number of Australian students travelling to the Indo-Pacific, understanding our nearest neighbours, having those experiences of being in the region and building friendships. And this is not, you know, these are not insignificant numbers. This is quite substantial. But in, more importantly, I think when we look at that, you know, the numbers only tell one part of the story. And one of the things that I'm really interested in my research here at the ANU, looking at the NCP and relationship building in particular, is when we think of this as part of our, our public diplomacy and our people-to-people -people engagement, our soft power, you know, I almost think that the term soft power is a bit of a misnomer. Um, it implies that it, it's easy, it doesn't take work, it doesn't take investment. But we know that it does. We know that building effective and enduring relationships in our region does take time and it does take investment. 
You know, and the NCP for the past eight years has been a wonderful step in the right direction in doing that. You know, the numbers alone, as I mentioned, they point to that. They show the kinds of engagement we've been having. Um, the examples uh, that we heard from earlier uh, from Secretary Campbell about what alumni have been achieving since they've returned home. This paints a picture of the kinds of engagement we can see, which is really important. But I think we can extend that even further. When we look to 2030 and we look at what the next eight years of the NCP might actually be, I think we need to really think about a couple of things in particular. The first of these is looking at how we engage with our host communities. I think host communities are so important to the NCP. Uh, they, you know, they're on the ground, this is where you'll be living and studying and interning, the people you're meeting every day when you're over there and the relationships you're building in these communities. I want to see the uh, host communities, I think there's a, a, a much greater role they can play in the design and the planning and the evaluation of the NCP and to see them really engaged and involved in that. Secondly, I hear time and time again from students who return from their NCP experiences and say, oh, I had the most incredible experience, I learnt the language, I'm so passionate about this now, I'm carving out my path, I know what I want to do, but I've come back and there's no room in my degree to study a language. I've come back and I've got no more Asia-focused electives. So what do we do for these students? We've piqued their interest, we know that they want to work back in this region and this is a path for them. But if we're not actually embedding the NCP as part of degree structures by funding Asian languages and funding Asia-Pacific studies in our degree structures, we're only doing half the work. Finally, um, I also think that there is a role for our students when they return from an NCP program and we can be embedding this in the community more if they can see and have the visibility in employability that their skills are valued. And I'll probably, uh, Doug will probably speak more on this in a moment, but Things like job adver advertisements, things like position descriptions, when students are seeing that their skills are valued in selection criteria in job ads, and not just in the desirable, but in the essential. You know, so I think there's a greater role that business can play here in terms of actually saying, we value your skills, we want it to be essential that you can speak an Asian language, essential that you've had experience interning in the region, and we're going to hire you and then promote you later and have that visibility that says, we value Indo-Pacific skills. I think they're all really important in terms of how we embed the NCP. Mm. That's, that's really fascinating. And I'm going to come back to John on the question about how the NCP can fit into university studies and to Doug on the question about employability and skills. But first, I thought I might ask you, Christine, um, you spoke earlier about the, um, the challenges in the rise of gender-based violence, discrimination against women in our region. But also we've heard about the potential of the new Colombo plan to be a force for change in our bilateral relationships. Is there potential for the new Colombo plan to play a role in actually addressing some of the problems of gender discrimination to empower women both in Australia and our region? And how can the scholars who are going out to study in the Indo-Pacific um, engage with some of the potentially gendered perspectives and, and be a force for change? Yeah, thanks, Susanna. Um, something that I'm particularly passionate about um, because you are all a force for change. Um, you um, can take your knowledge, you can take your knowledge of what is fair with you. But my first thing is you need to be culturally competent. You need to be across the, the country that you are going to and understand the complexities that are impacting women. Um, gender is but one of them. If you then lay, you know, and this comes to your awareness that Ellie was talking about, of, of doing your environmental scan of, of where you are and, and how the intersection of religion, mm -hmm. class, disability, and gender, and, and a whole range of other things, actually impact the ability to on women to contribute in an economic sense. Um, I've attended events recently on impact investing, so how you draw money into women's businesses. Mm. There are micro businesses, there are small, and then there are small and medium enterprises that you can lend your knowledge and advice to that women are running. They run micro businesses simply to put food on the table for their families. 
And so how do we actually get across all of the things that are impacting women? We need to hear their voices. You need to be present in a conversation, understand what the issues actually are, and lean into that community in a sensitive, culturally sensitive way that actually makes a difference. And, and I'll just share a, a really simple example from my former life um, <laughs> in uniform. Mm -hmm. And um, I was the defence advisor and attaché to New Zealand, Cook Islands and Chile. And on a visit to the Cook Islands, my very first visit in uniform, we were there for defence cooperation program talks, an important part of the defence connection um, that Doug was talking about. And I, you know, in my scan of the environment, I found that there were no women in the, pol in the police maritime wing that, you know, and the maritime wing in the um, Cook Islands operates the patrol boat that um, Australia has gifted um, one of the Guardian class patrol boats, in their case still the Pacific patrol boat, but there were no women in the maritime wing. And I said to the police commissioner quite casually, oh, um, I, d I don't see any women in the maritime wing, are they not on duty? That's a very loaded question. <laughs> I knew they weren't on duty. They didn't actually have a job there. Um, and he said, oh, oh, no, we don't have any women in the maritime wing. Um, and I said, oh, why is that? And he said, I don't think they want to join. <laughs> I said, oh, could I talk to them? <laughs> and he said, pardon? I said, could I talk to them? And he said, well, yes, yes. I, he said, I, I'd like to know why they don't want to join. And I said, great. And he said, and, and I just left it and we went on with the rest of the meeting. And he came back at the end and he said, so um, if I arranged a meeting, would you have time to meet with them this time or would it need to wait until next time you come? I oh, no, no, this time will be fine. So he, organized, he actually brought in all of the police women, those who were on duty and those who were off duty, so that I could have a conversation with them. And so I didn't know what I was going to find when I actually sat down with them. And a um, far different outfit to what I have on today, I was in my lovely white navy uniform <laughs> with all of the, the bling and looking quite intimidating. And I pointed out to them that this wasn't intimidating. It was a position of privilege that I was prepared to use to further their cause. That it was not about me, it was about them, but what I could use this position for to actually help them. And once I'd broken that issue, we got all sorts of conversations going. Who'd have thought? They, one of their greatest concerns was they didn't know how to swim. My stupid brain had said, you live on a Pacific island. Surely you can swim. Well, Aussies get taught how to swim at school. They don't get taught how to swim. I can send you an Australian, you know, uh, an Australian Defence Force female physical training instructor to teach you how to swim. <coughs> oh, issue gone. Mm. Um, <laughs> let's talk about, you know, and they'd seen that the men had joined the maritime wing and they'd only ever stayed there. They hadn't rotated back into the, the general police service. So they thought that they would not be able to have families because they would always be at sea. We can do some workforce planning. Mm. And, and just gradually, just sitting in the conversation and having that backwards and forwards free flow to understand what the actual issues were. And then I went back and had the conversation with the police commissioner with their permission and took the head of the Cook Islands Police Service women's um, group with me and we had a conversation there are now two women in the maritime wing of the Cook Islands Police Service and they are in Australia currently um, studying to uh, sail back the new Guardian class patrol boat. So that's a, a simple mm. but effective win. Mm. And, and you can build on that. Um, it is really sitting in those conversations, hearing them. And, and a phrase that I have, you know, a hashtag even, that I've heard in the disability group <laughs> is not about us without us. Mm. And I think that is the key to it, is we can foster this growth in the region. We can empower women if we uh, walk with them, we walk beside them, 
We don't stand behind them. Um, they do need our support. They do need, potentially need our advocacy to have their voices heard. And so be with them on the journey. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Christine, for sharing that lovely story. And I think it's just a wonderful example of how being curious and asking the right questions done in a sensitive way can really be something tremendously positive. So I think that's wonderful that you shared that with us. Um, and perhaps it's a good segue to turn back to Doug and talk about this question about cultural competence and um, how having skills and experience of the countries in our region um, can be brought to bear in the workplace. We heard Ellie mention earlier about the challenges that some New Colombo Plan scholars find when they come back to Australia in terms of translating what they've learned into sort of employment reality. Are you able to give your perspective on those questions about, um, let's call it Indo-Pacific literacy? <laughs> I'll have a crack. Um, so I think, you know, you're already in a very strong position in terms of employ employability. Uh, I've sat on the panels to interview scholars before and I'm blown away by the diversity, um, the intelligence, the very high university marks that show consistent application. But most importantly, um, two things. One is the focus on community service, which I think is increasingly a really important standout in your um, CV or your LinkedIn profile, a sense of giving um, rather than taking, and also um, your interest and your courage to take yourself out of your comfort zone and go into, you know, into, a, into an international market. Um, so you're in a very strong position and it's what you do um, from here to, to soak up as much valuable experience and uh, then when you come back, as our alumni know, um, there are pathways whether it's uh, the, attending the Lowy Institute or uh, Asia Link or the Asia Society or other, other uh, platforms that have been built to ensure that you can stay in touch uh, with the business leaders uh, as junior members to stay uh, updated and, and have a voice in the shaping of, of, of foreign policy because the, these organisations do feed directly into, into government. So. Um, a bit of a personal story, um, since we're telling stories. Uh, I, I, I started uh, my career uh, as a university student at UTS, uh, and in 1995 I got a, a scholarship to go to Taiwan and learn Mandarin Chinese. Uh, and that was the start of, of my um, unbelievable career to date. I had, uh, had an amazing year over there. For those of you that were born, um, <laughs> I had a... Uh, uh, at the time, uh, it was the first presidential elections um, in Taiwan. Uh, the Chinese didn't like it, so they started firing missiles off the northern tip of Taiwan. The US moved two aircraft carriers in there, and my mum and dad at home were having uh, apoplectic fits. <laughs> uh, but I was there, and I was fairly you know, casual. I was so young, I didn't, didn't really worry about it too much. But, but whilst I was there, we had earthquakes, we had typhoons, um, we had incredibly interesting food and it just shaped me and I decided from that point on that I was going to try and carve a career uh, out, of, out of an Asia focus and, and I have. Uh, I joined KPMG as a graduate as soon as I qualified as a chartered accountant I moved to Hong Kong then to Beijing and then to Hong Kong and then I worked across the region uh, on the Lehman Brothers um, liquidation and, and finally came home in 2012 to run our, our Asia business here. So it can be done, and you're in the perfect position to, to continue these sorts, of, these sorts of experiences. Not only is it good for you, but it's really important uh, for our country. Um, in terms of, in terms of uh, employment, um, you're coming into the market at an incredibly good time. Um, we, have a, we have a shortage of people, but do stay focused not only on the technical content, uh, and if you're into um, digital, cyber, AI, space, biotechnology, renewable energy, well done. <laughs> uh, but if you're into law, uh, accounting, uh, management, HR, philosophy, arts and culture, also fantastic and, and directly uh, applicable to, to the future that we, that we have. I think it's just a matter of making sure that you amplify uh, your your profile around the new Colombo plan experience 
it really does stand out uh, in, a, in, a, in a market where uh, we're looking for all-rounders, not just technically brilliant people. So I'll, I'll probably pause there, Susanna. Yeah, no, thank you, Doug. And I mean, your mention of just the range of disciplines mm. and academic backgrounds that um, that students are coming from on the new Colombo plan is is really useful. And, and perhaps, John, can I invite you to, to weigh in here um, really on, on anything that we've been discussing, but I thought Ellie made an interesting observation about the need to embed the new Colombo plan experience within what students are studying at university within the broader range of experiences that's available to them. Are you able to, to speak to that? I can, I can have a crack. Um, <laughs> I was sitting here thinking I need to come up with a personal story to... <laughs> um, and sadly, Sorry. I work in policy and advocacy and I have no good stories to share. Um, <laughs> but I will come back to one thing that was is personal, but I'll get to that at some point. Um, look, I think... Uh, from our perspective at least, um, universities, and there, there are university people here today who can probably speak to this much better than what I can, uh, are doing everything they can to afford as much flexibility to students as they possibly can in terms of their course of study. So the sort of degree that I did in the good old days, uh, you know, a four year honours degree, you know, a little bit of choice in terms of electives, but very structured in terms of what you did. Um, not that the new Columbo plan was around at that point in time. Um, that was several years ago. Um, just afforded no ability to actually engage in those sorts of programs. As we move towards modular degrees, um, double degrees, higher flexibility in terms of what you can study, when you can study, uh, changes to modes of delivery, uh, and I think this is going to be one of the things we'll see as an outcome of the pandemic is not necessarily reversion to online delivery, but an inclusion of online into some courses that may not have had it in the past so as to create more flexibility for students, is going to lead to a situation of where the sorts of limitations that have been placed on integrating new Colombo plan type activities into the curriculum are removed. It's never going to be simple because one of the things that we would like to see, uh, to go to Doug point, Doug's point about disciplines, is that the new Colombo plan is not just about students studying PPE or international relations or, or, or whatever it happens to be. It should be for students who are interested in having an international experience, mm. students who wanted to develop that cultural competency, students who feel as though they've got something that they could actually contribute. And so we would like to see students you know, from courses such as those ones I mentioned, but also in the creative industries, in arts and social sciences, students doing philosophy, students doing veterinarian studies, whatever mm. it happens to be. Uh, and we think that's a, an important point for us to focus on as, as, as we progress. But what happens after the NCP, to go to Ellie's point about students coming back and not having much else, and this is where my fantastic personal story comes into to play. <laughs> so um, I did do the traditional undergraduate, then I came to this fantastic institution here and, and to do my PhD. And I, was, my, I had a very proactive supervisor who said, look, there's this fantastic program called the Endeavour Awards. Um, maybe you might want to do one of those. And I thought, well, I don't know what it is, but it sounds pretty good. Um, and you know, my one piece of advice to you, although you probably don't need it now, is just look out for the opportunities. Mm. You know, there's no such thing as a bad choice in many respects. The choice that you don't make is the bad choice. But anyway, so he said to me, look, you can go overseas for uh, a few months and do some of your study overseas. So I did six months in, in Oxford, as far away from the Indo-Pacific region as you could possibly imagine. <laughs> um, my big regret is not so much about going to Oxford. My big regret is the fact that I've never learnt an Asian language. And in many respects, at my advanced age, it's probably not going to happen. <laughs> so I am sort of monolingual in many respects. Um, anyway, the Endeavour program, fantastic. So more flexibility, uh, students have, and also people who have graduated at various stages of their career can go out. Now, we don't have that type of program now, which I think is, is actually a shame. Um, Unfortunately, it, it, it ceased a couple of years ago, and there's a now a gap in our ability to actually provide senior students, postgraduate students, other sorts of students with the opportunity, and students in other sectors as well, with that opportunity to go and have a mobility experience, an outward bound mobility experience, as well as students coming the other way. And we'd like to see that rectified at some point in time. Uh, we're not a government organisation, we're not in caretaker mode, so we can kind of say what we like about what governments should do, and we'd 
possibly go to government and say, look, this is an idea that we'd like you to consider whoever comes in, in uh, following the election in May sometime. To sort of try and have a continuity, to have a continuum, if you like, of mobility experiences. I think I mentioned in, in my initial statement that the importance of the new Colombo plan, and I don't want to use the term soft diplomacy, I might use the term track two diplomacy. How does that sound? <laughs> that is right. But soft diplomacy does sound a little bit passive, um, and it's not passive at all. It's one of the fundamental things that we have in our arsenal in, in Australia that we probably under-recognise and underutilise. We put in a submission to the government's review of soft diplomacy a number of years ago, and we probably spent half of our submission talking about the benefits of international education, both in terms of recruiting as well as outward mount. Um, there's a lot of focus on the economic benefits of international education, and, and don't get me wrong, we, we recognise that. But the thing that we treasure, cherish, support more than anything else is the, the familiarity, the, the understanding, the, the cultural cross-connectivity that comes with actually sending young, smart, enthusiastic people from our country to another country and receiving those, those students. And we think that that is one of the primary reasons that we want to, will continue. Uh, to advocate and support for, for NCP. But the issue around the skill, the recognition of the skills that come through or with cross-cultural uh, competency through international exchange, through uh, inter-country experience, is sort of an interesting one in terms of our skills program moving forward. And probably the one thing I didn't touch on when I talked about what the future holds is there's gonna be a lot of conversation about how Australia feels at skills gaps. We're gonna need people such as yourself, domestically trained, uh, qualified, you know, potentially leaving the country, but then coming back and filling those skills gaps. But we're also gonna need people from international jurisdictions coming to Australia to actually fill some of those skills gap as well. And I think there's actually a lot of work to be done to make sure that we actually recognise the contribution that those people can actually make to our, our um, uh, and I don't want to use the term labour shortages because that doesn't sound quite right. It's actually skills. It's high skills. It's very high skills in, in many respects. It's not about people coming and flipping burgers and, and driving your Uber. It's the people who actually are the GPs. It's the people who are working in places, things such as AI, med tech and, and what have you. And there's a bit of work to be done in terms of making sure that uh, we have the mechanisms in place to recognise qualifications. Having you guys spend time overseas, work with those people, come back, move into government, become employers, I think that actually helps because you recognise what those people bring and the fact that they can be valuable contributors to, to our economy. Mm. Thanks, John. So we're, we're reaching the end of our time. So as we wrap up, I'm going to ask each of our panellists in reverse order to how we started to give their kind of key piece of advice or tip that they would have if they were starting their career in the Indo-Pacific today. But I thought, Ellie, you haven't had a chance to tell a story. Oh. So if you have a story you would like to tell <laughs> us, then feel free to do so as well. Okay. Um, well, thank you. Um, well, I guess like Doug, I, my career and my journey really got started through in-country study, but to Indonesia, not to Taiwan. Um, but well before that, it was through language. So my real passion is, you may have picked this up, uh, is around uh, languages. And it really set me on my path. So I was very fortunate to study Indonesian uh, at primary school, at high school, and then at university. Um, I also did my undergrad at UTS. Um, and it was part of the International Studies degree program and combined with communications. So five-year degree, double degree, and fourth year is overseas. So I was very lucky to spend a year in Indonesia, as many of you in the audience have and will do. Um, and I mean, I, I can't even express or, or understate the impact that this has had on my life. Um, the people that I met, the relationships that I forged, um, but you know, the things that you see that you're not expecting to see, the way that it allows you to see the world through a different perspective and to understand completely different uh, worldviews to your own, to understand the way that time works differently, the way that uh, social hierarchies are organised differently, the way that people socialise differently. You know, and these are the, the moments of, you know, people write them off, I think, as culture shock and it's challenging and they're, they're very disorienting and discombobulating when you're in them. But I think 
uh, it really is in those moments, if you grapple with them and you push through with them, that is where the real change happens for you personally. And certainly for me, that's, that's where change happened for me in my worldview. Um, so to go back to the original question around, I guess, a piece of advice, um, for those of you who are about to head out to the region, uh, I, would, I would really encourage you to keep an open mind and to be curious, but really to take, you know, say yes to opportunities. We've been talking about this a lot this morning. You know, the NCP is an incredibly privileged opportunity that you all have, and I think part of that is a responsibility as well. And It's a responsibility to engage uh, positively and proactively with your host communities, learn the language, to learn about their culture and to be curious about it, um, but saying yes to those things, and in particular, saying yes to having a different perspective. And I think in doing that, seeing what you might learn by seeing the world in a different way, that would be my, my piece of advice to those of you going out. And for those of you who've already been out in the region and you're back in Australia, again, taking the time to reflect on what you have learnt from that experience and how you now see the world differently and can contribute those skills and apply that knowledge to making Australia a more diverse and inclusive place uh, in our region. Mm. John? I don't think I can add much more, um, really. It's about saying yes to the opportunity. As I said, there's no such thing as a bad decision, really. It's when you put yourself in a situation where you try to risk manage things and you just take that overly um, conservative approach, you just it's just lost opportunity. So um, the transformative impact of an international experience is, is fantastic. I don't think it can be replicated in any other way. Um, I think also the, the, the one point that um, I probably haven't really reflected on, but we discuss quite a lot within our own organisation, is the impact of technology on international experiences mm -hmm. too. And so it's how you actually have that truly immersive experience whilst at the same time having technology at your fingertips to um, stay in contact with friends and family. And so you, almost, you sort of have like a, it's a quasi immersion experience mm -hmm. where you're kind of immersed, but you still got that, those contacts back home, which is probably very different to perhaps the sort of experience I had where I used to have to line up to use the public phone to, to call my <laughs> mum when I was, when I was overseas. Um, so say yes to the opportunity. Take advantage of the opportunities that then arise. Don't think you've, you've scaled that hurdle and that's it. I think once you get to wherever the, your destination happens to be, there are going to be other opportunities that you should take advantage of and you should be prepared to take advantage of those. Um, take advantage of the stresses and the concerns and the, the problems that plague international experiences. You, know, you mm. get over there and some of them are really minor things like shops not being open on the weekend mm. or the fact that um, there are religious activities which just close businesses down for, for days or whatever it happens to be. There's, there's, there's a myriad of them and <laughs> just kind of chill and say, okay, well, you know, that's how it is and that's where the learning comes from, experiencing mm. those sorts of things to realise that you know, your your day-to-day -day existence in Australia is, is not the only existence. There are all these other things taking place. Um, and last but not least, just enjoy yourself. You know, mm. this is one of the best times in your life. Um, and go over there and take advantage of the things that are that are offered to you. You know, I, I, I'm, I, I'm very envious. I don't think I have to tell you to learn a language. I think you guys have probably already done that. Um, but if you haven't, go out and learn one. Um, an Asian language would probably be good. Uh, don't do German, that doesn't help, I've done that. <laughs> no good in the Asia Pacific region, or well, not particularly good. Um, and uh, you know, you know make, make sure that when you come back you do reflect on what you've done and there will be so many transferable skills that come out of that experience that you probably haven't really thought about. Um, and sometimes it's good to talk to other people who have gone through the process as well and you start to identify all of these things that are going to be eminently um, attractive to, to employers moving forward. Doug? Uh, okay, I'll be, I'll be a, a bit more uh, elderly or mature here. I'd say uh, first and foremost, um, be safe and be careful uh, <laughs> where you're going. Um, a lot of things are very different. Um, so two eyes, two ears, um, trust your gut and speak later. We, there's a lot of differences uh, and I do encourage you to uh, not take an Australian um, attitude and a cultural tradition of speaking first and loudest. You know, really sit back, watch, listen and then talk and, and in a way that is respectful to, to the host community that, you, that you're living in. 
Um, I think there's um, a great opportunity not just to study the technical content but to, to, to learn and immerse yourself in language. Do a short course. You'll be amazed if you apply yourself how quickly you'll pick things up. You, you, you're sponges at this age, so you'll do very well. Learn a language um, and most importantly, don't just hang out with the other foreign students. You know, really put yourself in the, in the in, test yourself every day by putting yourself into the local market. Uh, it's a, I've lived in Beijing for a long time and I used to observe at the, uh, the local bar all the foreign students, all the Americans and the Canadians and the Aussies all sitting together drinking beers. I think, that's great, but you're kind of missing the point here. You know, get, get out and eat at the local cafes and meet friends that are local, local students and start to build a, a regional network. The next thing is, um, let's all link in, okay? Tell your stories along the way. We've told you some of our stories today, but we'd love to hear how you're going um, as you're experiencing amazing things. Start to share. It reflects very positively, hopefully, on the NCP. Uh, but do, do share your, sh sh share your um, insights and stories because they're very powerful. Mm. And, uh, you know, I can remember some, some great examples over the years. You know, Dominic McCarthy and uh, Talini Rajapaksa. Um, we've had some... We've had some some James Fairley have done great jobs around coming back. And that's my final point is the government here is investing in you. There is a sense that you have to go on with the job as much as you personally can, be your best and give back as an alumni and as an ambassador while you're overseas, but give back to the Australian um, you know, people and, and to our economy and be leaders because we are, uh, we're investing in you and we have great hopes for you. So. Uh, otherwise, again, like we've been through a pretty terrible couple of years, have fun, you know, really have a lot of fun and, uh, and get, some, um, get some great life experience. Thank you. Christine. Thanks. Um, I'd offer that you follow, my, uh, follow me um, via Twitter and there will be information coming out to you um, <laughs> regularly um, via um, Oz and Gender. Um, so you'll be able to find out what I'm doing in the region. And, it, and I'm planning to get out very shortly. So if I am in your country and we can connect, I offer that opportunity um, to check in with you and see how you're going. Um, provide that now friendly face from home. Um, so please do check in. Um, to reiterate some of what others have said, this is the accumulation phase of your career. Mm. Accumulate those experiences. You know, gather all of that don't say no to an opportunity. Don't ever say no to, would you like to? Mm -hmm. Your first answer should be yes, providing you're safe to, yes. Take, yeah, yes. to take drugs. <laughs> um, but, but look for those opportunities, take them. Um, they are there and you know, through that cultural immersion piece, you will actually get to experience the lives of the people that you are working with. And, and that will enrich your experience and please don't drop that when you get back. Mm. Those personal mm. connections enrich your life. I mean, I, we've talked about your business life and all the rest of it, but they actually enrich your lives and theirs. Um, so keep those connections going and live your dreams. Mm. Um, and to prove that you can learn language at a little, at a little older age, um, I'm going to share with you my um, Te Reo Māori um, whakatauki, my new um, Māori proverb, which is kia hiku e na waka koto ki te tai e pāriana, which in English is a rising tide lifts all boats. Be that tide, lift your fellow friends. Well, thank you. That's a beautiful mm. note for us to end on. I think this is so much more optimistic and enjoyable conversation than the ones I normally have, which are about <laughs> many of the challenges that we face, which have no real solutions. And it's just um, a privilege to have moderated such an uplifting conversation about the opportunities that you're all going to have to really um, you know, be, be a force for connecting Australia with the region over the next decade or more. So thank you so much for your time and attention and to our wonderful panel for their remarks.
Thank you. Thanks so much, Susanna, and thank you to our panel. I'm going to ask our panel to please stay seated, if you don't mind. Um, we're going to get a few photos of you in a moment. Um, but right now, we are about to move into morning tea, which I know you're probably all very excited about. Um, so we'll have morning tea back out in the atrium, and that will run until about 10.30. And following morning tea, we have uh, then breaking up into those um, group sessions that you have all signed up to already. I hope you remember which one you've signed up to. Now, if you don't remember which one it is, or you're looking to see which you know, room and breakout space you're supposed to be in, you can find all that information on the NCP Summit website. Now, you've all got a name tag. If you flip your name tag over, there's a QR code. You scan the code, you get to the website. Pretty good, huh? Um, so please check that out. And for those that actually don't have a name tag yet because you were a bit too late to register, please head back outside to the registration desk and do feel free to register for the summit out there. Thank you. Um, I just one more um, little point of admin is those of you that do have dietary requirements and that you've registered with us, um, please go to the main bar when you're outside for your morning tea and your personalised um, dietary requirements will be there with your name on them. If you have dietary requirements that you haven't registered with us, please do let the staff at the main bar know about those and I'm sure we can accommodate them. So it's been a fantastic morning. Um, we've had such a wonderful and rich discussion here from our panel. When you go back out to morning tea, I would encourage you to ask your fellow scholars and alumni to tell their personal story and then also test them to see if they can remember Doug's six Ds. <laughs> Just an idea. All right, have a fantastic day and I look forward to seeing you a bit later on. Thank you.